Good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us for this webinar, which has been hosted by AHDB Beef and Lamb. My name is Claire McKee, and I'm the Knowledge Transfer Officer for Beef and Lamb within AHDB. And I'm pleased to bring you tonight's webinar on Do Your Suckler Calves Absorb Enough Antibodies from Colostrum? Our presenter this evening is Alex Corbishley, a Senior Lecturer in Farm Animal Health at the University of Edinburgh. So Alex has worked at the university for five years now and previously worked as a vet in Northamptonshire and Cheshire. So the plan of action tonight is that Alex will run through a 35 minute presentation and then there will be time for questions at the end. You will all stay muted throughout the webinar, but if anyone would like to ask a question, then please type your question into the box on the side of your screens. If you can't see this box, you might have to press the orange arrow to open this box up. I will then ask Alex your questions once he's finished presenting. So hopefully there won't be any technical difficulties tonight, but please bear with us if there are any. So I'll now hand over to Alex. Thank you very much, Chloe. Uh, so as Chloe said, I'm aiming to talk for around 30, 35 minutes this evening and to really focus on passive transfer of antibodies, so colostral antibodies in suckler calves. And we're going to focus on data that's been collected from GB. So this is data that's relevant to uh, those of us that are farming in this country. Uh, however, I'll, I'll call on sort of things from the literature from other countries where, where it's relevant to that discussion. Before I start, I just want to acknowledge my PhD student, Rachel Bragg, who's done a lot of the hard work behind this and also helped put together some of the slides. So just by way of introduction, we all know colostrum is important, uh, but I'm conscious we've got quite a wide audience today. So just to recap why colostrum is important. Well, calves are born without any antibodies at all uh, to protect them from infections uh, out in the real world once, once they leave mum. So because of that, um, what they, I'm just gonna try and move thy window there, sorry. Um, so because of that, they're at high risk of these infections and the antibodies that they get from mum uh, are transferred through the colostrum into the calf's blood. And that process of transferring antibodies from mum's colostrum into the calf's blood is called passive transfer. Now, the failure to take up those antibodies is going to leave those calves at higher risk of infection, which has long term implications for the calf. Um, and we can classify calves based on how much antibodies they've received. So we can say that calves have had good passive transfer, and that's when they've had lots of antibodies from the colostrum absorbed uh, from the gut and into the blood. We can classify calves as having partial failure of passive transfer. These are calves that have had some antibodies, but they haven't had enough to get all the health benefits of having uh, enough antibodies transferred. And then we've got complete failure of passive transfer. And these are calves that just haven't absorbed any antibodies at all that we can detect. Now, there's a number of reasons why this might happen. Uh, the most obvious, of course, is that the calf just hasn't had access to colostrum. However, probably more commonly is that the calf does get some colostrum, but it gets it too late. And what we know is that it, in the first 24 hours of life, the ability for these calves to take up colostrum decreases very rapidly. And they're most efficient at absorbing colostrum in the first two to three hours of life. So for that reason, it's how quickly they get that colostrum that's as important as how much of it that they're getting. So hopefully that was revision for, for most folk. The importance of colostrum is something we've talked about for a long time now. And it's been very, very high profile in the dairy sector. So in the dairy sector, there have been lots of studies internationally and in the UK that have shown that it's quite a high level of, of prevalence of failure of passive transfer, up to around a third of calves not getting antibodies from their colostrum. But really in the beef sector, we don't know what that looks like. There are a few individual studies in certain countries, uh, but they can be quite contradictory. And up until the work we did with HDB in 2018, uh, we had no idea what was going on in GB. And that really hadn't changed for a long time. So if you look back in the literature, people were asking questions about suckled calves back in the mid 1970s. Uh, it was becoming apparent that this was important in dairy, but really not a lot known in the beef sector. So the little data that is available internationally does suggest that it's a 
a real problem. So studies in Ireland have put a range of between 22%, so one in five calves, to up to half of calves, depending on the study and the population they were looking at. Uh, again, in Canada, a big range in the data, uh, one study showing that it was as low as 5%, and then others up to a third of calves born. Now, it's really important for us to think about the consequences of failure of passive transfer uh, and what that means for the calf later on. Does it matter that half of calves on some studies in Ireland haven't had um, any antibodies from mum? Well, in a number of large studies that were done, again, in North America and in Ireland, they've looked at the impact of not getting enough antibodies on, on suckler calves. And suckler calves are two and a half times more likely to die uh, in the first four months of life if they haven't had antibodies through colostrum. Uh, and they're also up to three times more likely to be need treatment uh, prior to weaning. So that's usually antibiotic treatment for diseases like respiratory disease, for diarrhea, uh, for things like navel ill and joint ill. And on top of that increased likelihood of dying, that increased uh, risk of needing to be treated, they also weighed around three to three and a half kilos less at a 205 day weighing. So all in all, not getting enough antibody, and that's carbs that have got partial as well as complete failure of tra passive transfer, has a big impact on that calf's start in life. So we're really focusing on giving calves uh, the best chance in life uh, from the day they're born. So we did a study with AHDB uh, in 2018. Uh, we committed to sampling some calves up in Scotland uh, and then AHDB paid to sample a load of farms down in England. And we worked with a number of vet practices across England and Scotland, and we're very grateful to all the vets and farmers who gave up their time and, and commitment to gathering the data and the samples for this study. And we recruited about 86 farms, three of those were organic. And just to give you a bit of a feel for the farms that we were looking at, they averaged around 135 cows, so average herd size was larger than the average herd size for the UK. Uh, but the range was similar to what you'd expect, so from 20 to just over a thousand breeding cows. In terms of breed, the majority, so 57 of those herds, stated that they were predominantly continental, and 27 said that they were predominantly natives. Most of the herds were calving inside, however, seven of the herds we were looking at were calving inside and outside, whilst nine calved outside. And we aim to sample around 15 cows and 15 calves on each farm. So in total, we sampled just under 1,200 calves um, across England and Scotland uh, in spring 2018. So we tested the blood samples that were collected uh, for the amount of antibodies that those calves had absorbed. And these were the results that we got. So what you're looking at here is the concentration of antibody in the blood of the calf, and then the number of calves that fall into each of these brackets along, along this side of the graph. And the red line here is the cutoff for complete failure of passive transfer. So all the calves to the left of this line have had essentially no antibodies from colostrum. So either they didn't get any colostrum at all, or they didn't get colostrum until after they'd stopped taking it up. So they'd got that colostrum too late. The orangey yellow line here represents partial failure of passive transfer. So these are the calves that got some colostrum, but they didn't get enough to actually protect them against all of those uh, negative health events that I mentioned on the previous slides. And if we combine both the complete and the partial failure of passive transfer together, that's essentially one in three calves. So in spring 2018, uh, we found that one in three suckler calves in GB hadn't had enough antibodies or would have benefited from getting more antibodies from mum. And quite surprisingly for us, one in seven had essentially uh, not absorbed any antibodies at all. So what did that look like at a herd level? So what I've done here is I've plotted all the farms together. Uh, so each of these bars represents a separate farm. And then up here on this side, I've put the percentage of calves in each herd that have failure of passive transfer. So what proportion of, of the calves in a herd are suffering from this at an individual herd level? And what's the variation? 
So the first thing we can see is there's huge variation. So 25 of the farms, in all the calves that we sampled, they managed to get some colostrum. Uh, so the cutoff we're using here is a complete failure of passive transfer, but you know, on, on 25 of the farms, everybody got something. But then on another 25 farms, so that's a third of them, more than 20% of the calves did not really absorb any antibodies from colostrum at all. So we could say that they didn't get colostrum or they got colostrum far too late. So we can see there are individual herd factors that seem to explain uh, a big difference in uh, the quality of passive transfer of antibodies from calf to mum. And in terms of looking at the herd level, that's something that's a subject of ongoing work. We're trying to understand those risk factors at, at, a, at a broad level. But what we did do in this project was we drilled down into the individual calf factors that explain why a calf is at risk of not getting enough antibodies. So if we start looking at the risk factors for complete failure of passive transfer, these are the guys that really didn't absorb any antibodies. Uh, for, for the vets and scientists that might have called in today, you know, the, the threshold we're using there is 10 grams per litre of, of antibody in, in the calf's blood. So we looked at a number of things at the individual calf level. Uh, we looked at things like how body condition score, calving ease, uh, calf weight, those sorts of factors. And I'm just going to present the ones that came out as significant in the study. So the first thing that was significant was bottle or tube feeding the dam's colostrum. The next thing we found was being male, uh, being fed artificial colostrum replacer, being born to a difficult calving. I think it's important just to note at this point is that we excluded caesareans in this study. We did that for two reasons. One, because we expected the caesarean rate to be relatively low, which meant it'd be difficult for us to study that. But also other studies have already shown conclusively that being born by caesarean is a big risk factor for failure of passive transfer. So we didn't look at it in this study, but the take home message today is if a calf is born by caesarean, it is at risk. So we can actually put some numbers on these for you. So if we look at being male, that increased the risk by about one and a half times. If we look at a difficult calving, then a similar degree of increased risk, around one and a half times increased risk. What was quite striking is that being fed artificial colostrum replacer increased the risk over two times, and also being fed mum's colostrum increased the risk two and a half times. And what we what we think this is telling us, and, and what we think the message is from this data, is that stockmen, farmers are very, very good at identifying which calves need help, but we're not giving them enough help. And we'll talk a little bit later about how much help we need to give and, and when we need to give it. But this isn't saying that, you know, giving mum's colostrum isn't going to help the calf. It's saying that calves that have been picked up as being at increased risk that have then been helped are still not getting back to where they would have been beforehand. So what about partial failure of passive transfer? So these are calves that have had some antibodies. Uh, but they haven't had enough to get them up to the level they need uh, to not have these negative effects on health. And again, for the vets and scientists, we're using this 24 gram per litre cutoff. So in that part of the study, being a twin, probably not surprisingly, was a risk factor. Uh, having your dam as a heifer rather than a cow was a risk factor. Again, difficult carvings came up. Um, having been helped up to the teat to suck from the teat, and then again, having been given assistance either with dams colostrum or artificial colostrum. If we put some numbers on that, being born to a heifer increased your risk around 50%, so about one and a half times more at risk. Uh, being helped up onto the teat increased your risk approaching two times. A difficult carving, again, similar degree, twice increase. Uh, and then having been assisted with mum's colostrum was about 2.3, being a twin, a similar round, uh, sorry, an increase again up to 3.3, and then being given uh, some additional colostrum replacer was nearly a fourfold increase in risk. So again, focusing on the key messages from the previous slide in this one, there are some clear groups of calves that are at increased risk. So the ones that have had help calving 
the ones that have uh, been twins, and there's probably a lot of these that fall into the assistance at calving category. And then also at the bottom here, we're looking at calves that have been given some help. So they've been identified as problem calves, but they haven't been given that help either quickly enough or they haven't been given enough help to get them back to where we want them to be. So a similar theme between the two groups, the complete failure of passive transfer and the partial failure of passive transfer groups. So why might that be? What, what could be going on? We've had a look in the literature and, and this graph is redrawn from work that was done by Murray Cork in Cambridge back in 2012. So uh, there will be different products on the market. Some of the products may have changed in their specification. So I've, I've just put that caveat around this data, but it helps to illustrate and, and to see the point. And Murray looked at a number of different uh, colostrum replacer products and he measured the amount of antibody that was present in one sachet, so a dose of that product. And you can see here the amount of antibody in grams. And there's a big variation between the products, ranging from up to 80 grams for some of them, uh, down to less than 10 grams for some of the others. Now, you can see the variation between the products on this slide. On the next slide, we've now plotted that against the amount of antibody that a dam will give you at calving. So we've combined two data sources. Uh, this here is data from an Irish study. Um, we're going to go back to this McGee study later on in, in the talk this evening. Uh, these guys did a pretty brave study. Uh, I think they probably had some students with some crash helmets. Uh, they milked out cows entirely at calving and they weighed the colostrum and then they measured the amount of antibody that each cow yielded in their study. And they looked at cows that were being fed silage and they looked at heifers that were being fed silage. And you can see here that heifers give about half the amount of antibody as a cow does. So again, linking back to what we found in our study, being born to a heifer leaves you at increased risk of, of partial failure of passive transfer. And also a cow's giving you around 800 grams of antibody. And that's compared to uh, the colostrum replacers out there, which are at best just under 100 grams. It's worth noting that in the United States, the colostrum replacers must supply at least 100 grams of antibodies per dose. So the point of these two slides is to show that when we're thinking about helping calves, we need to think about how much antibody we're giving them. And if we have nothing available at all, then giving an artificial replacer is, of course, better than nothing. But we want to make sure that we're buying those replacers with the most antibody in. And therefore, it's well worth speaking to manufacturers about the amount of antibody that they have in their product uh, before choosing on which one you're going to use. However, if we have colostrum available from cows or heifers on our farm or from potentially a dairy farm that's of the same disease status, and that's really the big challenge is what you don't want to do is bring in antibody uh, diseases sorry, from other dairy farms when you're buying in colostrum. So ideally from your own farm, from your own animals will be um, substantially better than an artificial replacer. So how can we start to bring together uh, the various findings from these studies into some practical advice? Uh, it's very easy to get lost in, in the details of the studies, particularly academics like myself, we get very excited. Uh, how do we turn that into something that can be translated and, and used practically day to day on farm? Well, these Canadian, uh, these Canadian authors have put together quite a nice framework that I think helps us to really focus how we target our help. And what they did in their studies, they looked at the proportion of calves with failure of passive transfer that were born unassisted, that were born with a very easy assistance, so that's typically a calving without a jack, or that were born due to difficult assistance, so that would typically be a calving jack or a caesarean. And they found that overall, calves that were born by difficult assistance around two thirds of them had failure of passive transfer compared to around 14% of those that were born unassisted. They then further looked at the calves at 10 minutes old and they put their thumbs in the calves mouths and they asked, did the calf have a strong suck reflex or did it have a weak suck reflex? And if that calf was born unassisted and had a strong suck reflex at birth, then actually its chance of having failure of passive transfer was 8%. A calf born in the same way, an unassisted calf that actually had a weak suck reflex at birth, 
had nearly an 80% chance of having failure of passive transfer. And when you look at those calves that were born by uh, a difficult assistance, nearly all of them had failure of passive transfer or didn't get up and drink enough colostrum if they had a weak suck reflex at 10 minutes old. And therefore, it's quite a, uh, a sort of intuitive way of trying to make an assessment as to whether we think a calf needs help. And trying to distill that down into uh, an easy to uh, implement message on farm, thinking about feeding all calves born with any assistance at all, or calves with a weak suck reflex at 10 minutes old, helps us to really identify the calves that are most in need of assistance. The second part of that discussion is then thinking about what sort of assistance we need to give them. And we need to be targeting 10% of body weight. And for most carbs, we're therefore looking at three to four litres of dam's colostrum immediately after calving. So what we don't want to be doing is calving a cow and then saying, or well, what we'll do, we'll just give that calf some colostrum in the morning if it looks hungry. And this is a message that's just important for vets like myself, as it is with farmers. I'm very guilty of carving a cow and trying to get off farm as quickly as possible. And really, I need to be thinking much more about when I've delivered that calf. But I know that calf is at substantial risk of failure of passive transfer. The farmer's paid a couple of hundred quid for me to come out and carve that cow. So actually, what I should be doing is making sure that it's had three to four litres of colostrum before I leave the farm. And getting that discipline in place means that the animals that we've already caught up, so there shouldn't be increased handling, the animals that we've already put time and effort and potentially expense into are actually getting the help that they need uh, to have the best chance in life. So that can be put into a flow diagram uh, if, if, if uh, that helps in terms of thinking about things with the rest of the farm team. And if a calf's born with uh, assistance, that's any level of assistance, it was just pulled out gently versus uh, all the way up to a cesarean. Even if it's bright uh, and trying to stand up, we should be supplementing it with three liters of good quality colostrum uh, within two hours of birth. And where possible, we'd like to do that with a bottle, but actually, if you're comfortable and confident feeding with a stomach tube um, and time is short, then knowing that you've got that colostrum into the calf is the most important thing. If a calf's been born without any assistance and there are some question marks, one of the options you have is to check its suck reflex at 10 minutes old. Now, if it's got a weak suck reflex, you know that even if it was born without any assistance, it's got a really high chance of failing to stand up and actually suck within four hours of birth. And therefore, there's a strong case to go ahead and supplement it. Whereas if it's got a strong suck reflex at 10 minutes old, uh, you can afford to stand back and say, right, what we want to do is, is monitor it feeding off the dam and make sure it does get up and suck. And typically, when we're thinking about time spent sucking, we're talking about 20 minutes at the teat being necessary to suck around three to four litres of colostrum. So to finish off, I've been asked to mention a little bit about nutrition, to think a little bit about uh, how we're feeding cows in late pregnancy uh, and the relevance that has to colostrum production. And I think it's fair to say that, that the evidence is very patchy on the impact of nutrition on colostrum production. Uh, there's plenty of farms that, that we'll talk to that feel that it does have an effect, but experimental studies have really struggled to, to show uh, what that effect is and, and what the really important things are in, in a diet to drive colostrum production. Now this was a pretty extreme study, it's, it's the same study I showed you where they'd measured the total amount of antibody uh, produced by cows and heifers. And what they did in this study, they didn't just look at heifers uh, versus cows, they also looked at cows fed simply straw and mineral in the run-up to calving. And that's still something that we see quite a bit of. It, it's not a, a feeding practice we would recommend, but it's still something that, that is not uncommon to see on suckler farms uh, across uh, the UK. And you can see here that they measured the amount of colostrum and cows that were fed just straw and mineral in the run-up to calving did give less straws, uh, sorry, less colostrum. So about 600 mils less. Uh, what I thought was surprising about this study was that they actually produced as much as they did. 
But if we go down to the bottom here where they measure the total amount of antibody produced, you can see that the cows that were fed straw were still producing more antibody than the heifers fed silage, but they were producing around 130 grams less antibody. So the risk of the calves not getting enough antibody will increase uh, if, if the cows are on a severely restricted ration. But unfortunately, there's not a lot more data out there to really help us understand how nutrition interplays with the amount of uh, colostrum that the cow produces. The one thing we did as, as part of this study uh, when we were sampling the calves is we also sampled the cows and we did what was called a metabolic profile on those cows and we were looking to see basic information about the energy balance of those cows, the protein and, and mineral status of those cows. And I'll talk through what each of these graphs show, but I'll really focus on the ones in the red box that show the most interesting results. So BHB, glucose and NEFA, these are all things we measure in the cow's blood to give us an indication of their energy status. And we blood sampled these cows in the last two to three weeks of pregnancy, so at a time when the demands of the calf are increasing and when the intakes of the cow are likely to be dropping because uh, she's got less space in her abdomen that's being taken up by the calf. And on each of these graphs, a red arrow is negative and a green arrow is positive. They, they go different ways for different things that we measure. And the red is the cutoff uh, that we use for interpreting these tests. And what was interesting is we found about one in three suckler cows had high NEFAs. So one in three suckler cows were in negative energy balance and mobilizing body fat reserves right the way up until calving. Now, whilst we might want to mobilize some body fat in mid-pregnancy, we may want to get cows that have come in off grass well conditioned down to uh, our target calving condition of two and a half to three. In that last month of pregnancy, we want to be feeding cows to meet their energy requirements so that hopefully they're putting what they need to into the calf, they're putting what they need to into colostrum production. And also so that um, they're not in negative energy balance and more likely to have a slow or a delayed calving due to being in negative energy balance. Quite strikingly, nearly two thirds of the cows we sampled had low blood urea nitrogen. So urea nitrogen is a measure of uh, the amount of rumen protein in the diet. And the, you know, the majority of cows that we sampled were not getting sufficient rumen protein. And we generally think of rumen protein being important in terms of efficient rumen function, but also in terms of driving milk production once cows have calved. And therefore, there's some question marks over what impact that may be having on colostrum production uh, in our cows. We looked at blood albumin, which is a long term measure of, of protein status. And thankfully, uh, that was predominantly good across most of the cows we looked at. Uh, it's a bit different in sheep, um, but at least in the suckler herd, the albumin um, levels generally seem quite good. Um, and again, the total protein levels were, were generally good. So in terms of long term protein status, uh, there weren't any major areas of concern. The magnesium was interesting. So around a third of the cows that we looked at had low blood magnesium in that last few weeks before calving. The reason why I've introduced this in this talk where we're talking about colostrum is that low magnesium is more likely to result in slow calvings. It's also a risk for milk fever, or subclinical milk fever, which I appreciate we're talking about suckler cows, but there are still plenty of genetics in much of the national uh, suckler herd that have come from the dairy herd. And therefore cows that are low in magnesium in the run up to calving are potentially those that are more likely to have uh, calves that need some assistance. Even if it's not difficult assistance, they're more likely to have slower calvings. And then those are the calves that are less likely to have a strong suck reflex and get up and suck after calving. When we look at uh, the other things we looked at, so phosphate, copper, GSHPX is a measure of selenium uh, and iodine, the vast majority of farms that we looked at had good status for these things. There are, of course, some individual farms with mineral problems, uh, and those farms, of course, need to address them and supplement. But in terms of the overall population, the overall picture that we had, uh, the energy and protein and magnesium status were by far the most significant findings of, of that study. So I can't go into lots of detail about um, suckler cow uh, nutrition in late pregnancy, but in terms of general guidelines, uh, what we need to be thinking about with cows in that last month is focusing on meeting her current needs. 
Now, I appreciate that's difficult if you've got a, a long calving window. What you don't want to be doing is overfeeding cows in mid-pregnancy. But if we've got a relatively tight calving pattern, we're able to target nutrition, then we're aiming to feed cows in that last month around 90 to 100 megajoules. So we're certainly not looking to steam them up at 140 or 150 megajoules, but we do need to make sure they're eating enough reasonable quality forage uh, to meet that, that energy demand. In terms of protein requirements, the current recommended uh, amount for a suckler cow in late pregnancy is around 9% crude protein in the diet. I think that's uh, quite tight. Uh, it can be achieved with good intakes, uh, but quite often we find that intakes are limiting and I would see that 9% as a minimum. And a lot of herds, they're having to feed at 10 or 11% crude protein uh, to get sufficient protein into the cows. So 9% with excellent intakes of palatable forages, I think is probably fine. But if there are question marks over intakes, then, then pushing that up by one or 2%, uh, I think is important. In terms of minerals, um, the general recommendation for most dry cow minerals is around 100 to 150 grams. And it either needs to be a purpose dry cow mineral or a mineral that's higher in magnesium and lower in calcium. What we don't want to be doing is feeding finishing uh, minerals to suckler cows. And we've seen a few herds recently where that has been the case. And the problem with the finishing minerals is that they're the other way around. They're low in mag and they're high in calcium. And that's really to uh, aid bone growth in rapidly growing animals and to avoid uh, bladder stones, but it's the wrong way around to what a calving cow needs. But the guidelines are, are generally relatively straightforward, uh, and most rations can meet those requirements. And, and really where we find most of the problems in terms of nutrition in late pregnancy crop up uh, is intakes. So you know, is the diet fresh and palatable? Are we avoiding group and ration changes close to calving that might be dropping intakes? Uh, and there's certainly data in the dairy sector, and we have some data as well that shows that cows that are moved close to calving are more likely to lose their calves. And then also avoiding overcrowding. If we've got very, very crowded uh, sheds and limited feed space, then some of the lower ranking animals are going to struggle to achieve their intakes. So in the last few minutes, just to summarise what we've talked about, I'd, I'd like to draw your attention to the Colostrum is Gold campaign. So that's been running on and off for the past couple of years now, really focusing on colostrum in all farm species, so um, pigs and sheep as, as well as cattle. Um, but failure to get enough colostrum in beef calves in GB is actually quite common. So one in three calves had partial failure of passive transfer. They would have benefited from getting more antibodies. Uh, likewise, at a herd level, one in three suckler herds have at least 20% of their calf crop with complete failure of passive transfer. So you know, that's one in five of their calves that essentially haven't absorbed any antibodies from mum at all. We know that not getting enough colostrum can have major effects on disease, death rates and live weight gains. So we know it's important. It's something we, we are, it's worth our time investing in, in trying to improve that. And we also know that assistance at calving is a major risk factor and therefore really targeting those animals in particular is important. These are animals we've already caught, we've already put time and effort into them and therefore giving them the colostrum they need doesn't massively increase uh, the workload uh, in terms of targeting the most important animals. And then really when it's available, if it's something we have stored on the farm, uh, then nothing really beats dam's colostrum for antibodies. So if it's possible to freeze colostrum down uh, from quieter cows, uh, you can freeze it year to year. So you know if you've got some quieter cows that are yielding well, even if they're at the end of the calving block, uh, storing that down so that you can use it in subsequent years is very much recommended. So with that in mind, uh, I think we've pretty much finished on time. I'll, I'll hand back over to Chloe uh, to see if there are any questions. Thanks, Alex. Um, so while I'm waiting for some questions to come up, I'd just like to remind you that the presentation has been recorded, so it will be available to watch back on the YouTube channel. So do you want to recap? And um, thank you for mentioning the Colostrum is Gold campaign. So we'll be We'll be busy tweeting and, and putting some useful top tips online. So um, for the, those of you that are on social media, please do, do get involved. Um, so we have got a few questions already. Um, so the first one, Alex, 
Um, how come the US colostrum suppliers have products with over 100 milligrams of colostrum um, antibodies compared to the UK? And are there are there laws over here for the for the quality of the colostrum? So the reason that's the case in the States is because it's the law. Uh, and to my knowledge, there's no requirement um, to to meet that minimum level. So I would certainly ask the manufacturers uh, how much antibody is in is in their product. Thank you. Um, and the next one, if you feed with a stomach tube or a bottle, do you risk the calf not then wanting to suck from their dam? And then you do also risk the disturbing the calf um, establishing a bond with their dam and a, and a suckle reflex? Yeah, so it, it is a concern in terms of how the dam and the calf are, are going to bond with each other. Um, I mentioned moving animals. I think one of the important things there is, is giving them the space so you haven't moved them to a new environment. The cow's still in the environment that she carved in uh, and therefore that, that will help bonding. Um, in terms of the calf not wanting to get up and suck, if you've given it three litres of colostrum, it, it will feel a little bit more full uh, for, for a little bit of time, but actually it's more important that it's got those antibodies. And if it's weak and not, not getting up and standing to suck quickly, it's more important the antibodies in there, the colostrum's also an important source of energy as well. So if that delays the calf actually then sucking from mum, I think that's a trade-off worth taking to know that you've got the antibodies in the, that that calf needed. Thank you. Um, we've got a question here. Currently, this person is going through an iodine deficiency with the cows. Do you know what effect that would have on the calves after birth? And are there any colostrum products that supply iodine? Yeah, so it's an interesting question. There's a lot of work being done on iodine and colostrum at the moment, particularly in sheep. Um, so I guess in terms of low iodine levels, then the biggest impact that's going to have is actually on the calf's vigour after birth. So uh, herds with low iodine will typically experience uh, calves that are stillborn or calves that are weak at birth. And of course, a calf that's weak at birth is less likely to get up and suck. So I'd be less uh, concerned about supplementing the calf directly with additional iodine and more concerned about uh, how we supplement the cows appropriately. Uh, and therefore, hopefully, we've got calves with more vigour that are that are more likely to get up and actually suck colostrum uh, when they're born. It's just worth mentioning there's a lot of discussion at the moment around the opposite end, over supplementation with iodine, and over supplementation in sheep has certainly been shown to reduce colostrum antibody absorption. That data doesn't yet exist for cattle, um, so we don't. We don't have a clear message, but I think as long as you're feeding within NRC or AFRC iodine guidelines, uh, then we're fine. I think the real concern is if, if we're supplementing in maybe three different ways with iodine that, that we potentially risk um, overdoing it. But at the moment, the data we have in sheep, we don't yet have in cattle. Thanks, Alex. Um... In terms of recommendations for milking a cow's colostrum and freezing for a later date, um, how off, how long after calving should you could you wait until to harvest the colostrum? Yeah, so that's a, a common question. It's another a really good consideration. So I think there's two things there. The first one is we can actually measure the quality of colostrum, uh, and we can do that using a device called a BRICS refractometer that your vets will be able to point you in a direction of. I think it's also in the HDB handbook that's been updated. Uh, you can get them on the internet for between 10 and 20 pounds. Uh, they're used by people who brew cider for checking whether their cider is up to scratch. Uh, and if you put a drop of, of colostrum on your refractometer, if it's above 22%, then it's good enough to freeze. So that's the first thing to consider, is that even if you've taken it a little bit later than you thought might be ideal, if it passes that test, then it's still good to store. As a general rule, the antibodies in the colostrum really do drop off very rapidly after birth. So um, by the time you're at 24 hours old, you're pretty much uh, moving on to much, much more dilute colostrum. Um, so I would generally try and go for the first 12 hours, but to check it, with the colostrometer or sorry um, with the Briggs refractometer uh, and if you're pulling colostrum off cows at 12 and 24 hours old and it's over that 22 percent threshold then it's still good enough to use uh, in future.
Thanks, Alex. And whilst we're on the subject, would you discard any frozen colostrum after 12 months or can it be kept for longer? Yeah, so the general advice is 12 months. Um, so I think if you're able to replace what you've got in the freezer uh, every 12 months, that's good. Obviously, if you've got nothing in your freezer at all and it's 13 months old, then it's better off giving it something than nothing, particularly if you're confident that it's been at minus 20 the whole time. Uh, but the general advice is to try and uh, rotate the stocks every 12 months. Thank you. Um, and would you recommend milking a, milking a cow's colostrum in freezing if it's from a heifer? So I think my concern there is making sure the calf's had enough. Um, I guess if you've got a heifer that's, that's really, really milky, uh, then, then I can't see a reason not to. Uh, the, the biggest concern is obviously the overall yield. Uh, again, going back to that other point about measuring the quality, something you can do and therefore it helps in that decision making as to what you do with any excess classroom you've collected. Thank you. Um, and the next one, would you recommend, I'm oh, sorry, um, is there any data on older cows in the context of the antibodies um, concentration in their colostrum or is there a reduction in overall yield as the cow ages? Yes, yeah, so that's interesting. Uh, we didn't see an effect in older cows, so it's not something we saw in our study. I guess yields generally increase up to around sort of six or seven years old. Uh, in, in cows. Um, but no, we didn't see any real strong data. I guess the only thing would be if you've got cows that are sort of very old and they've maybe lame or they've got other diseases that mean they're having uh, more problems calving, that might increase the risk of, of being more likely to have a calf that's less likely to get up and, and get its colostrum. But in terms of colostrum production, uh, it's not something that we've seen in our data, no. Thank you. Um, I've got a question here regarding pre-carving vaccines. So in this case, Covexin and Rotavec, is there an optimum time frame for administering, bearing in mind um, this person's carving pattern is over eight weeks and when therefore would be the perfect date to administer? <laughs> yeah, so uh, it's it's well worth thinking about that and chatting with your vet carefully about that one. Uh, generally, we would say um, you're looking at around three to four weeks pre-carving. So what you want to do is you want to get a really high antibody concentration uh, in, in the bloodstream of that cow and then for those antibodies to go from the cow's blood into the colostrum to then transfer over to the calf. And it takes a couple of weeks for that process to take place. Um, so you really don't want to be doing it any closer than two weeks pre-carving. Um, of course, if your carving's running over you know, more than 12 weeks, then you may actually have to think about splitting the group or repeating the vaccine. It is an expensive vaccine though, well not um, Covexin, but uh, the, the scour vaccines are quite expensive and therefore you really do want to be trying to only give them uh, when, once if it's depending on the brand uh, one injection rather than the two so if you're carving over eight weeks uh, then you shouldn't be hitting that 12 week window and therefore around three or four weeks before the block starts will mean you've got the highest level of antibodies in that colostrum uh, ready for those calves sorry if I made that a bit confused just there are a number of different uh, vaccine brands out there some of which are one injection some of which are two Thank you. Um, I've got another one here. Is it okay to use boluses to supply the cow's minerals instead of feeding dry minerals? Yeah, that's absolutely fine. Just check the manufacturer's recommendations in terms of duration. Uh, but generally, we, we're big fans of either bolusing um, or top dressing the feed. Uh, they're much more reliable ways of ensuring every cow's got something. Uh, we tend to find that buckets can be quite unreliable. Uh, you have cows that love buckets and other cows that don't use the buckets. And of course, it's the ones that aren't using them that are more at risk. Uh, so yeah, absolutely, boluses or, or top dress mineral or even mineralized concentrate if, if you're needing to feed concentrate. Uh, but uh, we've got plenty of suckler herds that, that are feeding forage alone all the way up to and through calving and are able to meet the cow's needs without actually needing to feed any concentrate at all. Thank you. Um, and the next one, are colostrum substitutes a risk and which diseases do we need to ensure they are free from? Are foreign substitutes secure? So anything that's sold on the UK market 
um, is as close to uh, being free as possible. And the reason I'm just a bit careful with my wording there is that there are certain diseases where it's relatively straightforward to ensure that the animals you've collected from are free. So BVD would be one example. It's relatively straightforward to make sure that your herd is BVD free. Yoni's disease is, you know, we technically don't have a disease free category. We have a risk level one category, which is the lowest risk level. Uh, so anything that's sold on the UK market will be as close to free of everything as, as you can get. And I'd be confident in, in buying that. Um, I can't comment on things that, that are being sold in other markets. Thanks, Alex. Um, somebody said here that they read an article in the Farmers Weekly the other day and one farm said they give their cows a colostrum booster before calving. Do you know what this is, please? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, and I would be careful about um, just what evidence base there is behind different products. So um, I think it's important to make sure uh, that the cows are in stable groups and fed according to their uh, needs in late pregnancy. Um, but I don't think there's a lot of evidence behind um, any particular product that might uh, specifically boost colostrum. Thank you. Um, and what protocols would you suggest for freezing and thawing stored colostrum, please? OK, so uh, we'll deal with freezing first of all. So what you want to do is get it into usable uh, volumes. So uh, a litre is a sensible amount to freeze down because it defrosts faster. And then, you know, if you're going to take out three litres, you're taking out uh, three separate uh, packets. Uh, you can freeze it in sandwich bags. You can buy free, uh, colostrum bags if you want to. Uh, but if you freeze it in sandwich bags, uh, Ziploc ones, then you can lay them flat in the freezer. And then once they're frozen, you can, of course, stack them up and, and store them efficiently in the freezer. But more importantly, when you defrost them, they've got a large volume to surface area, other way around, sorry, got a large surface area to volume ratio. And therefore, they'll defrost quickly, which at two or three o'clock in the morning is often a key consideration. So freezing them down in, in packets that defrost fast allows you to make your life easier when you need it. I would certainly write on the packets with a uh, permanent marker and um, the date you collected it. Ideally, the cow's ear tag or management number so that if you're testing for Yonis, let's say, or if that cow goes down with, with something like Yonis, then you can locate that colostrum and, and throw it away. Uh, and if you are BRICS testing, you could write the BRICS number on there as well so that you know uh, the relative quality of, of what you've frozen down. Uh, and then in terms of defrosting, um, generally we try and avoid the microwaves. Um, the reason for that is that uh, in, when you defrost something with a microwave, you get some very, very hot spots and some cooler spots. And in the very hot spots, you risk damaging the antibodies. So I, I would defrost in, in water that's hot to the touch. So it's just slightly uncomfortable to put your hand in, but certainly not boiling. So you, you're probably talking around 50, 60 degrees if it's just too hot to put your hand in. Um, and then defrost it fully before, before giving it. Um, but it's definitely planning in terms of how you freeze it down makes the defrosting bit much more straightforward. Great, thank you. Um, we've got another question here. This person gives colostrum as soon as possible after birth, but they feel that 10 minutes would be impossible if the dam is um, doing her cleaning up. And also three litres of colostrum seems a huge amount. They say that their calves tend to seem full after a litre. And we've also got a similar question from somebody else that, do you think the calves, uh, calves abramasum can actually take three to four litres? So their calves at home seem to take 2.5 at most, and they're around 30 to 35 kilos birth weight. So do you have any comments on, on that, Alex? Yeah, so I think the comment around the 10 minutes is fair enough. You know, if you want to give a calf a bit longer, that's fine. What we're trying to avoid is it being five, six hours before that calf has had any assistance. So um, we're aiming to get things done as quickly as possible. If you're aiming for two hours, then that's grand. The 10 minute assessment of the suck reflex was, was what they found in that study as a clear indicator of a risk of a calf not standing. If you did the same thing at half an hour or 45 minutes and that calf had a weak suck reflex, then you'd be even more motivated to help it because it should be that much more vigorous and with it at that age. So I think that's a very fair comment. You know, if 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 you don't quite want to get in there and, and disturb mum and calf, um, it can wait. But what we don't want to be doing is waiting hours 
you know, we want to be doing this um, as soon as practical after birth. Uh, in terms of the volume, uh, yeah, it's we get sort of a mixed discussion um, with with folk when we when we talk about this. Um, Ten percent of body weight is is currently the recommended. So if carbs are around thirty to forty kilos, it should be able to take around three liters. Uh, there's certainly no harm in giving two and a half liters and then coming back and topping up with another couple of liters a few hours later. So there is no harm in doing that at all if you are concerned. Uh, regarding how much colostrum the calf can take. On the dairy side, there are herds now pushing up to four, four and a half litres in a single tube feed. Uh, I think there is a risk with those that you're going too far, that you're leaving a calf that's uncomfortable. Um, but um, I think at, at three litres, we're, we're still comfortable at that point. Thanks, Alex. Um, was there a difference at all between the calves born inside and those born outside in terms of the failure of passive transfer? So no, we didn't see that as, as an effect uh, in, in our study. I think we have to bear in mind we only had seven of the farms that were exclusively outdoors, so we had a big, big bias towards the indoor or the mixed calving herds. Uh, so no, it's not something we saw. Thank you. Um, and we've got one here. Somebody says the US recommendation to feed dairy calves is eight litres of colostrum. Um, do you have any comment on that of why, why our recommendations are so different? Yeah, so it may be that what you're seeing in that eight litres is the recommendation for the first 24 hours. Um, so we're really focusing on making sure that we get the, the uh, amount that we need in quickly after birth and we've already had one question here about you know we can only get two and a half litres in so we're trying to find an amount that we can give straight after birth uh, that the calf can take and around 10 percent of body weight is where we're sitting there um, I think that eight litre number is probably coming from the amount of colostrum you'd want to give a calf uh, particularly on a dairy farm in the first 24 hours of life um, and what we'd hope on a suckler farm is that if you've given that three litres and then that calf is up and sucking uh, you've given it what it needs to get the antibiotics Bodies it needs and then it's going to get up and, and get the rest in terms of nutrition and uh, the rest from the, from the cow. So I think we're probably talking just slightly different time frames in terms of those numbers. Thank you. Um, and those cows with a negative energy balance, do you know which ration they were on? Was there any particular pattern? Yeah, it's interesting that one. So we're still looking at that data. Um, there were clearly some herds that had an inappropriate ration so straw and mineral would be you know the one that i picked on during the talk um you know you can't meet a cow's needs in late pregnancy with, with a solely straw and mineral ration um there were plenty of cows on rations that looked good on paper uh, that were running out of the ration or they were overstocked so they weren't able to eat it so uh, that was definitely a common finding was ration was fine but actually intakes were poor uh, and in the same breath, we in the outdoor calving herds that we had, we had two or three farms, I think, that were on fodder crops. And we had some with excellent results and some with terrible results. And again, that was related to how much of the fodder crops they were actually eating uh, in a day. So you know, even if they were inside or outside, um, even if the ration looked good on paper or the fodder crop should have been meeting their needs, if they weren't eating enough of it, that was probably the most common reason that we saw for, for poor energy balance. Um, if you think about the energy density of, of forage to get 100 megajoules into a cow, let's say for sake of argument that cow's eating 10 kilos dry matter, then it only needs to be a forage of 10 megajoules. Uh, per kilo dry matter which, which is not hard to achieve so it's usually intakes uh, rather than an underlying problem with, with the forages uh, that said we do get the odd herd that's feeding hay that's of poorer quality than than straw uh, but but i'd say they're more uh, the exception rather than the rule thank you um, and do you have any tips to get calves sucking with little or no suck reflex yeah we get asked that one and unfortunately no it's really it's a really difficult one and there are a couple of herds we've spoken to that seem to have a surprising proportion of their herd where the calves have a have a weak suck reflex so unfortunately beyond them um, beyond sort of nursing them early in life and trying to get them as much help as possible up to the teat um no i guess thinking a little bit about the risk factors um 
calves that have had a slow calving are more likely to have a suck reflex. Then there's a process called acidosis where the acid builds up in the blood during a slow calving and that will make a calf uh, weaker to suck. Uh, premature calves are also more likely to have a weak suck reflex. It's one of the later reflexes to develop. Uh, during calf development. So we know some of the risk factors that we could maybe try and um, at least notice or, or address, uh, but no, it can be quite frustrating uh, if you have uh, an ongoing problem with, with calves with a weak suck reflex. Um, I guess that's always one to open up to the other participants. If anyone else has, um, has, has had that problem and found anything to work, I'd be delighted to hear because it's something we get asked every now and then that we don't have a good answer to. Thanks, Alex. Um, why was there a reason why male calves were more likely to be deficient? It's probably calving ease related. So male calves are more likely to have a difficult calving and therefore more likely um, to have insufficient antibodies. Uh, it's a slightly technical reason, uh, but we couldn't put calving ease and maleness in the same model. When we tried to do that, the computer didn't like it. So we had to consider them separately, uh, which means we can't control for the two. But the most likely explanation is that they had difficult carvings. Thank you. And um, were there any differences between the native and continental calves? <laughs> when we get asked a lot, no, there was no breed effect that we could detect at all. Um, so yeah, I I am um, I I done this talk a couple of a few times face to face, and there's always uh, particularly the. Um, uh, particularly uh, the shorthorn society that will say, oh, get yourself a shorthorn, that'll solve all of your colostrum problems. Um, but no, we didn't find any any breed effects. Thank you. And um, apologies if you mentioned this one, Alex, but how many grams of antibodies should there be in the artificial colostrum? What are we, what are we looking for? So in, in the US, the minimum was 100 grams that they're allowed to sell there. Um, I'm aware that there is one product in the UK that claims to have um, just over 100 grams. Um, so yeah, if we are buying it, that's the sort of number we're looking for. Thank you. Um, and we've got a comment here that given the lack of colostrum on numbers of calves dying or treated for illness, a reduction of 3.35 kilos at 205 days, they think is surprisingly little. What is your view on that? So they've already controlled for the ones that have died so um the ones that are so severely diseased that they've died aren't included in that number i guess it depends on the study herd that you've looked at so these were research herds so they're likely to have gone in and treated those animals very quickly and very aggressively when they've been unwell so that will of course mitigate any severity um, of, of an effect on growth rate uh, because of course the antibody uh, effect on growth rate isn't direct it's indirect through their increased risk of disease so if those calves when they get sick are very rapidly targeted and, and treated uh, then you're you're more likely to have a, a sort of a milder impact on growth than you might expect given how much more likely they are to die or need treatment thank you and the very last question is how do you overcome acidosis in a newborn calf OK, so um, if you've got a vet out to it, then the vet can give it um, an injection in the vein of essentially bicarbonate. Um, and and you can, if, if you're not having a vet to it, you can put some bicarbonate in the uh, colostrum just to help address the acidosis there as well. Um, so you can spot a calf with acidosis because they, they typically breathe very, very fast and they're quite dull. Um, but it is something that um, if, if you're going to drip a calf, the vet will be assessing and will be addressing. And it's one of the reasons why they can respond so well to fluids in the vein. So generally, um, you, you try and get a vet to a calf that's severely acidotic um, to, to give it the best chance of getting up and, and recovering. Thank you. Um, so that was the last question. So we've had lots of interesting questions tonight. So thank you very much for everyone at home for listening. And thank you, Alex, for that interesting presentation. Um, so the recording, like I've said, will be emailed in the next day or two. So if you do want to recap on anything heard tonight, it will be available on the Beef and Lamb YouTube channel. Um, so thanks again and have a good evening, everybody.